Now we define events to be mutually exclusive if they have no overlapping elements. Like in the last video, we looked at an example where we had an event in the case that we flipped three coins and one of the events was they all came out heads. Uh, and a different event was they all came out tails. Those were, uh, we referred to them as disjoint in that video, but by definition, those are also mutually exclusive because they have no elements in common. It's not, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have any to do, anything to do with the individual outcomes. It has to do with the chain of heads, 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 and tails, tails, tails. Those were not exactly identical. Um, say you had heads, heads, tails, that would also not be identical because it has to do with the total event in this particular case, which is, uh, you know, it's um, a chain of events. So it's not, it doesn't have to do with the individual parts. But anyways, but notice what it says is that is A intersect B is equal to the null set. Um, and just as to, rem to revisit these ideas from chapter two, uh, remember that A intersect B means the common elements of that set. And when it says it's equal to null set, that is saying that basically the ha it has no overlap. If we're thinking about a Venn diagram where the shared elements are in the middle, the middle elements are the intersection. Uh, and in this case, it's saying that that's empty, meaning there's nothing in common su such with A2 and A3. By definition, we say they are disjoint or uh, mutually exclusive. Um, however, like say we're looking between A3 and A4, A3 and A4 are not mutually exclusive because they contain a common element. And that's just what you want to look for. If you're looking at the sets, look across the whole set. If there's any common um, element chain, um, they would not be mutually exclusive. So this is relevant uh, for theorem 4, 9.9-4, uh, which says that if events A and B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of the union of A and B, which is equal to the probability of the sums of those separately. And really, this is just another way of doing exactly what we did in the last video. Because it says, but basically the probability of this or this occurring, which was uh, the kind of that last question we answered is, what's the probability that all flips are the same? Basically, either all heads or all tails. Um, and remember that when we're using the or operation, logically speaking, that always translates to a union of the two sets, right? Because if we if, if it's acceptable to have either all heads or all tails, it'd be the union of those two individual sets. So really this A4 here was A2 union A3, which is equivalent to A or B occurring. Um, and it says it's equal to PA plus PB because they're mutually exclusive. And because they were each individual probabilities that had nothing to do with each other, we can find the joint probability by simply adding them together as we did. So really it's just another way of saying what 9-3 did. It's just using the set uh, notation. Uh, so let's look at a, another problem. Number six says, in this event of rolling doubles from example five, is it mutually exclusive to having the sum of rolls be at least eight from example two? So there's an is missing in there, I apologize for that. Um, but that, you know, typos happen. Um, on accident. Um, and so then it asks, can we add these probabilities to obtain the probability of event E occurs in which either doubles uh, or a roll of at least eight are thrown? So again, that's not very good English. Uh, I'm a little tired and probably was a bit tired when I wrote this, but let, I, we, we, we can still answer this question just fine. So let's look at this E5. Ba basically, it's comparing the events E5 and E2. Um, and I believe I can just copy these from what we did before uh, so that I don't have to rewrite them all. But let me just go ahead and snag this and copy it down below. Um, actually, we'll just drag it on over. Steal it from before. And I'll steal um, event two, which was over here. Actually, instead of stealing it, um, I will just we, I can show them both at the same time. And basically what it asks us is this event, uh, the basically which was just the doubles. When rolling two dice, the our suitable outcomes were rolling doubles. Is it mutually exclusive from E2? And again, what we want to do in order to figure this out is see, is there any overlap? And just to revisit E2 since it's been a couple videos, that was the list of outcomes uh, where the sum of the dice rolls was at least eight. So two, six, three, five, all of those uh, as long as it's eight or more, it satisfies that um, condition. But here, these are not mutually exclusive because we can see from E5, E5 consists of four, four, but those also add up to eight. So there's a duplicated entry 
I'll go ahead and underline in this in red um, in our um, E2. So right off the bat, they are not mutually exclusive. And you could even, what, what you could do is actually write out the intersection um, as kind of proof that they're not mutually exclusive. So if we did, well, what's the intersection of E2 and E5? That would be all the column el col common elements. So 4, 4 is in the intersection of those two sets. We also have 5, 5, 5, 6, right? Because 5, 5 and 6, 6 also obviously add up to 8 or more. And so there are three events in the intersection. And all this means is that we are, we, we say these are not mutually exclusive. So another thing is if we were going back to the probability of those events, this is a common mistake uh, when students are working on probability, which is why I think it's important to really look into. But, you know, the probability of E5 we calculated was 16.6 repeating percent. Now the probability of E2, we calculated in number three. Uh, we had 15 different roles, role pairs that came out to higher than eight or higher than or greater than or equal to eight uh, out of the total 36. So, which came out to be 41.6 repeating percent. But basically, we should not add these together to get the combined probability of either E2 or E5 happening. And that's again, because those events are not mutually exclusive, they have overlap. So if we add those together, what we'd be doing is adding duplicated events together. So the probability would be too high. And there is a way to adjust for this if you'd like. What you could also do is take the union of E2 and E5 and calculate that based on how many, how many elements would be in there. Uh, but there's kind of a simpler way if we already know the intersection, which we do. So let's look at the um, number seven is a formula for dealing with um, probability of union sets when there is an intersection. But this is a more general formula because this formula only worked for mutually exclusive events, but this following formula actually works for any union, um, which again, you might, this, this is similar to a cardinality formula, which we had uh, back in chapter two. Um, but anyways, so the probability of A union B, which would be just joining two events together and figuring out uh, the probability of either or happening, um, it says it's going to be equal to P of A plus P of B minus P of A intersect B. So, you know, looking at it in this case, the probability that of one event, it should be the probability that either E2 or E5 happen is equal to the, the probability of E2 happening plus the probability of E5 happening uh, and minus the probability of the intersection happening. And so the, the question might be, how would I ever remember this formula or why does this make sense? But essentially what this is saying is take the probability of one thing happening, which was 40, basically we had a 41.6% chance to get at least eight um, total roll add it to the probability of the second thing happening, which was the probability of rolling doubles. And then what, basically subtract off whatever the extra probability was, right? Like as I was just saying, those two probabilities have some overlap. If we just add them together, there's gonna be too much. So the third part of this formula is basically subtract off however much is too, uh, is left over. And, and that's just the probability of the intersection occurring, which Basically, this was duplicated, right? If I compare those two sets, 4, 4, 5, 5, and 6, 6 were um, duplicated. So if I just subtract off the probability of those happening, it will, it will correct itself and give me the proper probability for uh, determining when either 8 or higher will be rolled or I will get doubles. And so that, and that of course, would just be 3 divided by 36 because that the probability is always the number of elements divided by the total. There was three elements in there um, so uh, divide it by 3 out of 36. So if we go ahead and do that, uh, maybe it would have been wiser for me to leave those in their original fra fraction forms. So let's go ahead and rewrite it. Uh, probability of E2, we simplify to be 5 twelfths, and probability of E5, we simplify to be 1 sixth. So, um, oops, the calculator's in the way there. Um, and if we simplify 3 out of 36, that will give us 1 12th. The probability that we will either get 4s, 2 4s, 2 5s, or 2 6s. 
And then uh, if we made a common denominator here, this would be two twelfths. So I'd have seven twelfths um, minus one twelfth, which would be six twelfths or one half. So it turns out that I'm gonna have a 50% probability to either get an eight, higher, eight or higher or roll doubles. And that's again, basically what we're what I'm trying to work on here is how do I solve more elaborate, more difficult types of questions? Um, and it like in my mind, it involves breaking it down into simpler parts, looking at well, what's the probab probability of one event, probability of a different event, comparing. But you can always just go back to the basics and say, what are all the outcomes? What are all of the you know what's the full sample space and just do a direct probability that will always work as well. Um, and if you're a little bit um, lost on how to use these, or you know, you're, it's been a while since you've studied the set notation and stuff, this can be a little daunting. Um, but hopefully, it's I'm, I'm making it clear where I'm getting these numbers and what it all means. Um, that'll be the end of this video.